Hey guys, welcome back to the Tony Robbins podcast. This is Annie York, Editorial Director for Robbins Research International. In the last episode, you heard from Tony and investing legend Ray Dalio as they dove into Ray's new book, Principles, Life and Work, covering some of the key lessons that Ray's learned for over his lustrous career and the key tips, tactics, and insights he wants to pass on to others. Now, in this special follow-up episode, Tony catches up with Ray to dig a little deeper into a few core principles that each and every one of us can gain practical and even personal advice from. So first of all, Ray, it's great to hear your voice again, and thanks for taking extra time with us. You know, you recently asked on Facebook what the favorite principle was or quote from your book from so many people, and I wrote that one of them, for me at least, or so many, was that most of life's greatest opportunities come out of those moments of struggle. It's up to you to make the most out of those tests of creativity and character. And and I've always believed that crisis creates breakthroughs for people. Very often people don't do anything until they have to. And so related to that, our viewers are kind of interested in knowing where the markets are today and how should investors think about investing in an environment that's so driven so powerfully by the Fed. And then kind of a subset of that is really just, well, how should individual investors think about you know, uh, dealing with the inevitable market crashes because people are concerned about market valuations right now. And when we talked before, we didn't really touch on this. So love to get your point of view about how they can take advantage of these types of environments and how they should think about market crashes. One of the things we try to do is educate people that, you know, corrections happen, you know, for the last 115 years, they happen on average once a year, that we get these crashes every three to five years. It's been a long, much longer time than that on this run, obviously. So how should people look at the markets today how should they look at how to deal with when inevitable crashes come? Well, I think that when you're asking the question about uh, the issues of struggle, um, let's go to the psychological. So I think you're really talking about uh, psychology and yes. markets. Yes. You're talking about even cycles. Yes. Um, um, so let before we get into the particular of the moment, there is this uh, behavior pattern of people um, that they get very much caught up in the moment. And the history of the average investor is to sell at the lows and to buy at the highs because they get caught into that particular cycle. So now you're asking the question of how should a person operate that way? There are two ways that you can approach this. You can either approach that as, as seeking balance and playing the game, always being in balance and saying, uh, if I'm in balance, I'm going to be good. Or you can play the market timing, You can, which is basically saying, okay, now that there's a crash, what do I do? Now that there's a rally, what do I do? And in other words, being the active player who's moving in and out. I think it's very important to distinguish those two approaches. Because the balance is one of those things which I think the individual can do very well. Yes. The, the, the timing in which the individual um, plays poker against the pros in terms of saying, I'm going to be the right one to buy when I'm terrified and the thing is falling apart or to do the opposite is, is probably not going to work well. There's so much that goes into the analysis. So um, it really depends on which one you're wanting me to answer. I would say, um, first, balance. What the individual should do is learn how to do the balance. And I think you wrote it up so clearly and well. You know, it takes more than a couple of minutes to be able to get into it. But in your book, we discussed it. You've you've found it. And you can explain how the individual can achieve balance. And I think that would be the most important thing. If you're going down that, that path, then the natural thing that you end up doing is that you buy at the lows and you sell at the highs. Because what happens is if you're having balance and let's say the stock market goes down, what you have to understand is another part of your portfolio will go up. Maybe it's the bond market goes up. Maybe it's the gold market. Because if you achieve balance, you realize that it's almost like squeezing a balloon. You know, it goes for when, when it contracts someplace, it expands something else. The losses that might take place in one part of the portfolio produce uh, essentially gains because of changes in that environment and by having that balance. But when it when the one goes up, then and you rebalance to achieve that balance, then naturally you're going to take profits from that which was the most adva- did the best and go down and buy those things that were uh, less in order to get back into balance 
And that's the way to play balance. And that would be what I would recommend for the, y- y- your investors. If you're going to play the game of trying to play poker a- against the pros, then you better understand how to do that with information. We, we literally spend hundreds of millions of dollars in trying to take information and do all of those types of things in order to compete against the other people. And I, I you know, I, I, I don't know really how to tell you how to do that well, but just have humility because competing in the markets is more difficult than competing in the Olympics. The average guy thinks just because he has an opinion, he thinks he's going to be able to walk away, but you have to take money away from somebody in order to make money in the markets better than the averages. And that's a tough game. So, I, uh, you know, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Well, and in my experience, that's the reason I was so grateful to you that you, we went into such depth on your all weather. And now we call it the all seasons version you gave for the general public, because without that, I mean, nobody makes it. The statistics that we quote for people is, you know, you look at the last 20 years of the S and P and the average return has been 8.2, but in the, if you miss just the top 10 trading days in 20 years, it drops down to 4.5. And if you miss the top 20 tra- trading days in that 20-year period, it drops to 2.1. You miss the top 30 trading days, you lost money. So people that think they can time almost never do. And you did such a beautiful job. But I, I just want to bring it people's attention because the markets get overheated. People start thinking about how to play those markets. And as you said, some people are going to do that, but not many human beings have been able to do that successfully through time. So I wanted people to hear that directly from you instead of me. So Thank you for that. Yes, it, you know, you also um, pointed out that um, over the last 20 years, um, after these plunges in the market, um, in the two weeks after of the 10 worst days, you had the best days. That's right. Six out of the 10 okay. best days in the 20 year period <laughs> from right. JP Morgan. So, so, who do you think is buying and who do you think is selling? during those days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the person who is selling is the reactive person who is panicked at that moment. And, and, you know, the buyer is the ability to know the difference and where the value is. And that's, you know, that's a tough game. So I'm, we're in sync. Perfect. Okay, good. I just want to hear people hear that from you instead of from me. So thank you for that, because there's so much uh, talk about it right now, as you can imagine, with markets where they are. Second question I had for you, just to follow up, is, you know, everybody seems to be fascinated these days with digital and, you know, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so forth. Bitcoin dropped 20% over the weekend, yet it's still up 500% on the year. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this type of an asset? Is this just going to Vegas? Well, what's your, what, you know, how do you establish real value with a product of this nature? And what, what's your view? Um, I think that there, it depends what we're really talking about. Are we talking about Bitcoin specifically? Are we talking about blockchain? Are we talking about digital currency? Some of these terms uh, get confused. That's so let me, give you my, let me give you my thoughts on each one of them. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me start with the currency thing. There are two purposes of a currency. Um, a medium of exchange, you can buy and sell things with it, and a storehold of wealth. When you buy a bond or you put your money on deposit, you get paid back in a currency. And it's because of the expectation of that currency value that you make loans and you put in the form of deposits or buying bonds and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right now, these digital currencies are not effective in either of those two ways. In other words, by and large, not perfectly. But in other words, if you try to take your digital currency and you go out and you say, I'd like to buy stuff with it right now, it's very, very undeveloped. So what's happening now is is not largely not that in that regard. Right. And in terms of uh, the uh, storehold of wealth, it's not an effective storehold of wealth because its volatility is so great that it's really speculation on its volatility that is having the market participants. So it is a speculative market that has underneath it, um, by the way, there are different versions of it, like you point out. There's there's uh, Bitcoin, and then there's Ethereum, and then there's another one, and another one, and they will be that way. So the way that I view it is that underneath it is a technology blockchain that is a totally valid, great technology that I think will be very important in our future. So it's very similar to saying um, this is like the Internet. Do you believe that the Internet will do well? And then when you say, do I want to b- bet on block? Uh, do I want to bet on Bitcoin? That would be something like saying, do I want to bet on that particular technology? Will Bitcoin 
become BlackBerry, okay? Because Ethereum or the next version comes along, even while the blockchain uh, technology and the development of currencies and, and whatever happens. So right now, so you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? I think that um, the blockchain technology is great, but just imagine that you were saying the internet technology is great. Okay, then which stock do you buy and how do you play that? That's a difficulty. Yes. The idea of being a, a, a viable currency is a is a long way off, although central banks will use the blockchain technology and and make their digital versions of currencies, although they'll be behaving quite differently than the ones that we're looking at. So it's, uh, you know, are you playing? What are you doing? Are you playing for the long term investment of technology? How, that's like saying, how do you play with the Internet? Not an easy thing yes. because its manifestation is. I will say that right now, most of the um, um, the playing with it is uh, or the uh, let's call it, it the speculation in it is for a, uh, a sale, a resale. And it's a lot of speculation going on. It has the ingredients. If you were to take Bitcoin and then some of the others, it has the ingredients of a bubble. OK, yeah, meaning it's a risky thing and there's not a good grounding. So I just want to distinguish what I'm saying. It's not something that intellectually I could get my head around um, how to deal with Bitcoin other than the speculation. I'd be concerned. I like the underlying technology as a currency. It's got a long way to go. Perfect. That's beautiful clarity for those. Uh, I just want to bring back one moment, though. You, where you mentioned earlier, we're talking about the balanced portfolio in any environment and how it helps you to you know, buy low, sell high, per se. Um, what is the, you talked to me before and said most of your money, at least for the money that you have for your family and for, you know, for your foundation and so forth, it's in a balanced strategy. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. It's in the, the same type of strategy that uh, uh, we talked about and that it's covered in your book. Perfect. Just want to make sure people understood that too. <laughs> Knowing where you put your money is helpful for people. Uh, two last questions real quick. Um, you know, you did a study of normally successful people, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, and so forth. What did you find they have in common? You know, you, you're one of them, but when you look at the other people outside yourself, you I know you've taken a lot of various personality tests and you focus on qualities that they might have in common. What do these great business titans have in common that you found? Um, and by the way, uh, you're one of them and has the same sort of qualities in, in common. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, Thank you. First, um, they have an, uh, they can visualize um, a future and see a present mm -hmm. and see the gap and have a compel compelling need to eliminate that gap. Mm -hmm. And it, it's 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 a compulsion. It's a I, 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 I need I need to reduce that gap. That's true. And they have a practicality that actually lets them do that, that they go into it. And they don't let people stand in the way of them doing that. That's This is the interesting thing, but they operate in very open-minded ways, but they also don't let people do that. Because when you have an independent point of view that is not popular, that is different from the crowd, as each of those people say, um, you don't know whether you're right or whether you're wrong. But you, when you visualize it and you can taste it, and people around you are telling you it's wrong, it's not the right thing. The question is, what do you do with that? And so what they will do is they will work themselves through that. They will have, um, a, in other words, they'll do the double checking and whatever yes. it is, and they'll, through, and they'll pursue it with perseverance. And they pursue it smartly with perseverance. In other words, they understand risk and reward. Yes. They don't mind. They don't mind making mistakes along the process of learning to get to the journey. They believe that's right. They can. Uh, and an, a very important thing is in dealing with the feelings of others. This is a this is a big dilemma. I, um, uh, um, Mohammed Yunus, the founder of micro yes. uh, microfinance, yep. received the Nobel Peace Prize, the, the Congressional Medal of Honor, determined. Uh, uh, it was assessed by Fortune magazine to be one of the top greatest entrepreneurs of our time. He has given his life to other people. He, uh, he doesn't take any income himself. He just puts it within these things that have great social impact. And he in, 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 will not let the other people stand in the way of the goal. A lot of people have discomfort. 
In other words, um, there'll be somebody, they've got to be made sometimes uncomfortable. You've got to cut through and get to the, 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 um, the job done, even if it means discomfort for, for people. You've got to work yourself through that. They are people who can see the big picture and the details. Yep. Maybe, maybe they see it all themselves, or maybe they're working well with others who can see things that um, that they know that they can can. Hmm. I won't refer to some some of the names because I've done these uh, discussions with them in, in the personality tests, and I you know promised to keep the the particulars private. Sure, but there there is there are some people who can visualize the big thing. Okay, let's say Elon Musk. Uh, going to Mars, to in other words, colonize Mars, yep. okay, and 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 the, and such things, and at the same time, can pay such attention to the details, um, and so that that range is a big deal, and they they achieve that range. And I'll give you other names. I'll, I'll give, I'm thinking of other people. Won't give you their names. Sure. Who are able to basically see the big picture, but no, they can't see the detail. And then they have partners. The biggest secret to all of this is to know how to partner well with people who could see where you can't see and to one way or another be able to see the big picture and execute the details. So to put together the the teams correctly, they also um, tend to do things that are um, that you assume people uh, don't do together. Let let me give you an example. Um, Very creative but also very structured. Yeah. I oft, ordinarily, you'll have a creative person who, you know, you say, oh, they're very, very creative, but, you know, they don't like structure. And, or a very structured person doesn't like creativity. Both of those things are needed. Now, whether they do that together or whether they are able to do them both simultaneously, that's the thing. So they have vision. They, that gap is the thing that they have a compelling need to uh, eliminate, and they do it with, uh, by bringing together these different qualities, whether they have that in themselves or in partnership with others. They all really, um, the best ones are people who not only have good mental maps of how things should be done, but they have high levels of humility. It may mm. not look that way to an outsider. You may look at some of these people and you could say, wow, they just sound so brilliant and they're, they're asking the questions. But if you're in discussions with them, and I'm sure you've been in discussions with them, sure. when, what you find out is generally speaking that what they, they're, they're, they're curious, they're voraciously curious. They're wondering if they're wrong. They're taking in information. So they don't look as confident when they're doing it, um, when you're in those conversations. It really depends who they're speaking with. They have an ability to distinguish the, the smartest people to speak with from the less smart people to speak. So, so they tend to speak to the smartest ones that they can speak to, but they like to find people who disagree with them so that they can make sure that they're right and they can learn. Yes. It's beautiful. Wow. That's one of those thorough descriptions I've heard. And you know, when you talk about the compulsion to close that gap, <laughs> I can certainly relate to that with it myself, not to mention the people that you've mentioned and the people you and I have as mutual friends. We all seem to have that, that portion in common. It's the one that jumps out to me most, but you're absolutely right. If that ability to see the big picture and the details, there are very few people do that, but the bridge, the people that do bridge, and you say they have a really a great ability to partner with others who have those skills that they're missing, what makes them effective at partnering like that? What's the quality in them that makes them the, effective the, at partnering? The, 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 the number one differentiation in character is the ones who can go above their own opinion and yes. to see it through others' eyes. Mm. Like, I, I, I've observed this um, repeatedly. There are certain people who are attached to their opinion. They think, well, just because they think they have this opinion that the opinion has merit. I mean, there are terrible, terrible opinions. The ability uh, in one sentence, to, um, in two words, the ability to be simultaneously open-minded, to take things in, to take information in and process it, and also be assertive so that they can do the back and forth Yep. is the ability to so to rise to say I might be wrong and how do we f together figure out 
whether I'm right or wrong. So, you know, there are th- three things that, I've, that are essential to do in order to have an idea meritocratic relationship. And whether that's in partnership or it's in a family relationship or almost any relationship, it, it, it's a better relationship if it's an idea meritocratic partnership. That means yes. not just one person's in boss and somebody else follows. Yes. And how do you have to do that? There are three steps that you have to do. First, you have to put your honest thoughts on the table. They put your, their honest thoughts on the table and you could look at them. A lot of people have problems doing that. <laughs> But they have to that's but that's important. The second thing is you have to know the art of thoughtful disagreement. In other words, what I'm describing, the ability to take in and think and work yourself through that to view disagreement as a curiosity and a respect for the other person to do well rather than an argument. There is an instinctual subliminal reaction to disagreement that makes people think it's a fight or there's something. And I, and I want, want to emphasize, decision-making is a two-step process. First, take it in. Second, decide. Mm-hmm. Your taking it in does not in any way diminish your ability to decide. You're being stupid. Any of us, I'd be stupid if we don't take it in and then decide. So the capacity, so step number two is to have thoughtful disagreement. First, your honest thoughts on the table. Second, the, know the art of thoughtful disagreement. And number three, that if disagreements remain, to have agreed upon ways of getting past them. You could have the best partnership in the world, and you're still going to reach a point where you disagree. Well, what are the rules of the game to get past that? This could be with your life partner, or this could be with your business partner. Do you have a protocol that when you reach that point, you're going to follow that protocol? Give us an okay. example, if you would, Ray. Give us an example, if you would, Ray, because it makes so much sense. Well, uh, I mean, um, there are all sorts of protocols. You could either say uh, we go to a third party to arbitrate. We flip a coin. We do at Bridgewater, we do what we call believability weighted decision making. Believability weighted decision making is that uh, uh, groups, uh, maybe it's too complicated to explain in in a nutshell, but it's basically that um, knowing each person's believability that actually is scored with points that come from um, an agreed upon system of how many points you have, um, you get believability. So let me give you the concept very simply of believability weighting, because we all do this in in our own way. Supposing you have um, a serious disease, and now you can make your decision of what you're gonna do about that disease. The smartest thing that you could possibly do is to find the three smartest doctors that you can find who are willing to disagree with each other openly yes. and, and, to he, and to hear that conversation and to, and to go through that. And because let's say all three doctors tell you to do the same thing and what they're telling you to do makes sense. Okay, then you have a green light to go ahead. If they're willing to argue with each other and you can hear that, then you'll get a, an education that's really fabulous and you could ask the questions. And then when it comes to the end of the day, you're going to sort of say, I have to make my decision. And you, and if you're smart, you will weigh that decision based on your assessment of the different doctors' believabilities and the issues that they're having. That makes sense. So partnership, th- these are all different ways of getting past the disagreement. But you must have a, dis- a, a means of uh, an agreed upon way. Yeah, in, know, advance, in would, advance, because I otherwise would, it just becomes another fight, right? <laughs> most common and the best way is to, uh, just for generally people, your, the people who are listening out there, is if you both mutually agree on who it is that might be a friend or somebody who you say, oh, we trust their judgment and they'll help you through it and we're going to go and we'll, let, uh, we'll work ourselves through it with their guidance and let them decide or whatever, leave you where that, that'll help probably, that's the most common. That's beautiful. I, I have to. I just want to echo to those listening. I, for me, anyway, everything you said makes so much sense. But the the concept of looking at disagreement with curiosity and respect, the combination of those two qualities is spectacular. I mean, that only out of that you get truth, you get creativity, you get connection, you get new ideas. I mean, it keeps the openness and yet still allows you to grow and stand and make your own decisions. Beautiful. Last question for your time, my friend. Um, you know, uh, I, on a personal note, I noted that you uh, stepped down as the co CEO 
uh, and you t- talked about the next five years, your involvement in Bridgewater is going to you know, diminish or transition a bit. I'm just curious. I know you're going to be working on another book on investment principles. And beyond that, what does life look like for Ray Dalio in this next chapter? What's next well, for you? First of all, um, just to be clear, um, my chapter in my, my life here is to make sure people are great without me. That's my number one mission. My game, I'm going to play the markets in the game with Bridgewater as much as they want me to do it. And I'm going to do it as an enjoyment and a pleasure because I'm, I'm, I, I love that. It's like playing, I don't know, chess or, te- or yes. tennis or whatever skiing since I was a kid. Yeah. I'll do it for the rest of my life because I love it. And so I'm going to be able to be more engaged in that because I'm not having to manage the company. So I'm, I'm excited about doing that. I'm going to do that. And um, and then but my, uh, my number one objective is to make sure that people are good without me. So I then have, have other things, um, spending time with my, uh, my family, my gr- my grandkids. I have two grandkids. I've got a third on the way. I'm <laughs> telling you, it's a joy. It's a thrill. <laughs> I'm curious. I love adventure. I love ocean exploration. I love so many things. My life is so packed with very, very interesting things that I don't have anywhere near enough time for them. But so the markets and the get the economy and the world will be my passion, plus all these other things and spending time with friends. But it'll be a different phase in my life in that I will feel um, every one of them is totally joy, joyous. It won't be out of the same sense of obligation, because if they're well without me, then I'm good. And so that's why I wanted to write this book pass along everything that I know that it's been of value to me. I put it into the book. I can say to myself, honestly, when my grandkids read the book and I'm not around anymore, I don't have any advice that's now in me that's not in that book about life and and work. And when I do the same with the investment principles and the economic principles, then it's outside of me and others are good. And and I, you know, and, and it's a joy. Well, I, I, I am amongst the fans and friends of yours that are so thrilled that you're sharing this with the world because the world needs it so much. And we can see that. And the book is skyrocketed on the best-selling list. And anyone who's listening here, if you haven't already picked up principles, go get it now. It'll change your life. It'll show you how to run your life and how to run your business. More importantly, it'll make you think about the principles that are most dear to your own life that will shape your decision-making, shape your life. I can't uh, rave about it enough. It's touched my life as you have raised so many times. And I want to emphasize, while these are principles that help me, and they're principles that help a lot of people, the most important thing, I'm speaking to you and the audience, the most important thing is that you have your own yes. principles, yes. and that you, you think about it. Um, and I would, I would recommend, because I stumbled on it, that if you can write down your principle when you're encountering something and you clarify it. You can clarify it for other people. I think we're in an era in which we have lost even the connection of what is principles. We, it, 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 um, just a, it, you have a moment more, Tony? Yes, I, I do. Of course oh, I do. Okay. Um, I think that we were in an era um, in which uh, there was religion and religion was such an important thing and it's diminished. And when we had the religion, it did think about different principles. Maybe there's some differences between the religions, but basically a lot. They would think about principles. And they created a um, community of principles, and there was common principles. And as we, as the, uh, the popularity of religion has declined, when we've come into an era um, where there's the, more the individual, we're not thinking as much about um, what is a principle as distinct from a decision? Um, in, if you think about it in, in school, it won't teach you such principles of how to live your life or um, just generally speaking, um, even thinking, what are your principles? So I think we're in an era in which there is the individual and I like individual thinking um, and, and I respect it. So I think we're in, a, in an era in between a time where we will need to be clearer on our principles and in, individually and then collectively. And the way that we're going to come by that, that new era, I believe, is by individuals writing down their principles and being clear about the principles, starting to think in a principled level way 
And then by being clear on the principles, then we could see what principles do we have in common and what are the principles that separate us. And I think it's an issue for our country right now, because if you take a look at it, what are our principles? Are we just fighting over tactical things or do we have principles in common? Uh, And what are those principles? For example, um, you know, like the notion of uh, equal opportunity. Is that a goal? Is that a, is that a principle in common? What are uh, what is it that are our principles that bind us together as a people? And and what is it individually? I think that there's a gap in those things. And I think by being clear, whether you you don't have to even write down your own principles, you might find that you like this person's principles or this religion's principles or that. But to be clear on what your principles are and to operate in accordance with those principles and to be able to communicate them with others is the most important thing. Because whether you have principles in common is what binds people together or divides them. And I think it's important to be clear. That's the most important thing. I think you're absolutely right. And I think, uh, you know, without clear principles, decisions are made just emotionally, they're made irrationally. And that's where you see the worst part of human beings very often, or at least the least successful part of human beings. But when we find those in common, that binding is there. And it's easy to make decisions. You know, people get focused, as you said, on tactics, and they forget we all give a damn about our children, whether or not you believe that guns should be available or not be available is a cra- it's a crazy example. It's out there for everything. And uh, we're going to turn the tables on this interview in a second here. We're going to take a quick pause and we're going to flip over and I'm, I'm taking the reverse role. You're going to be interviewing on my principles. So I'm interested to see what we come up with. But I think, you know, everything in my life is based on principles. I couldn't get up and do seven days in a row, day and night, 12, 14 hours a day with people from 75 countries. Uh, when people stand up, I don't know what they're going to do, but I have a set of principles that no matter what they do guides me to help them to get to where they need to be. And so without that, I don't know how I'd even function. So I really, I first want to thank you for this part, for jumping back on again for these additional questions, Ray. And I'm just, again, want everybody to go pick up your book immediately because this will guide you to figure out principles that can enhance the quality of your life, enhance your business, but also, as you said, guide you to really uncover what are the principles that matter most to you so you can align your life with what you believe is right for you and align with other people in a way that allows you to grow your organization, your family, your community, your life. So thank you for this. I really, really appreciate it. I love every time we have a conversation. It's so stimulating, Ray. Me too. Love it. Thank you. Okay, brother. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more on Ray Dalio's Principles, Life and Work, visit www.principles.com, where you can watch Ray's TED Talk on how to build a company where the best ideas win, listen to some excerpts from the audiobook, or simply order your own copy of Principles today. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins and Mary Buckheit. Annie Org is our editorial director and occasional host. The podcast is produced by Carrie Song and Tyler Culbertson. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Special thanks to Diane Adcock for her creative review. Copyright Robbins Research International.